This is the One Piece Podcast, episode 811 for the week of Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024. My name is Ed. And my name is Sam. And Sam, primarily on this episode, we're going to be doing a triple anime recap for the last three uh, anime episodes. I think we skipped a week in there, too, at some, po- at some point. So this is the last month's worth of anime episodes that we're going to be going over. Uh, do you have those what, what those episodes are in front of you? I have, let's see, it's 1097 is The Will of Ohara, Inherited Research. 1098 is The Eccentric Dream of a Genius. Mm. One whole sentence. <laughs> and 1099, Preparations for Interception, Rob Lucci Strikes. He certainly does. Uh, so that's what we'll be doing on this episode. Next week, however, we're going to have a, I think, a, a volume recap for the most recent volume that came out in Japan. I should know what that is, but uh, volume 108 recap. Eight. Right. There we go. But uh, yeah, so that's pretty much all, uh, you know, and that, that'll take us through, I think, the, uh, the rest of the hiatus, hopefully. And uh, yeah, the manga's on uh, the three-week break now. Yep. And uh, one other thing I should mention at the top of the show is we are going to be live at the City Winery in New York City on April 14th. I'll be there. Zach will be there. I think uh, a few other people will be there as well. Mike Patton, a uh, friend of the show, as well as some others. But uh, tickets are available now. Uh, so that's April 14th at 3 p.m. Please check it out. I haven't been to New York City in like over a decade. So uh, I'm going to stay right in the middle of everything and see how well it goes for me. Come say hi. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. That, that's all I've got for for an intro. But uh, Sam, do you want to get right into the anime recap? Let's a go. All right. This is the triple anime recap for episodes 1097 through 1099. I'm your host, Sam, and today with me, you're, li- you're genuinely <laughs> never going to guess this. There's, there's, there's a million people it could be. You're not, it's, it's not the one you're thinking. We have Ed. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. You know, most weeks, like people, like we go on for a long time on the manga recap and people, people can be forgiven for forgetting. <laughs> But it's literally just me, and I opened the show this week, and it's only you and me, so I really hope nobody is surprised. But uh, it's good to be back on the anime recap. It's, uh, you know, I find myself enjoying the anime, even in its slower weeks, more and more these days, because I can reliably count on there being about 17 and a half minutes of genuine content here. And even when it's slow, it kind of breezes right by. Yeah, um, episode, so up first we have episode 1097, The Will of Ohara, Inherited Research. And we open on Ohara itself, West Blue, 22 years ago, fresh, after the uh, catastrophe, after the the, the tragic uh, bombing of the Buster Call. And uh, in this, in the wasteland, in the desert wasteland left over, we see a funny looking cactus. Oh, wait, that's not a cactus. That is a young, quote-unquote young, Vegapunk. Uh, back when he had his full head, not not just full head of hair, the whole rest of his head is there, and it, it goes up. It's like a very tall, like a bulbous shaped. Uh, Bonnie calls it like, like, a, like light a light bulb. bulb yeah, like, like Rudolph. Later. Is that the idea? Has that been the idea the whole time? <laughs> He's, uh, I don't know, Rudolph the Giant Brain Man. And his hair hasn't turned gray yet, so it's like he's, he just looks like a brown, fuzzy cactus uh, from certain angles. His size is slightly confusing to me. Like, when they do that thing with the light bulb in the later episode, he's, like, roughly a little bit bigger than Jinbei. But, I mean, I guess yeah. it's, it's him It's him talking. He says, oh, I was almost the size of a giant back then. I'm like, no, the fuck you weren't. <laughs> like, sometimes he's, um, sometimes he's, like, shorter than Luffy, and other times he's, like like, twice as tall as Luffy. I mean, yeah, he does tower over Luffy at a couple points in these episodes. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure what kind of a funny little old man, what what kind of little he is. He's a funny little so, man if uh, if you're Whitebeard, I suppose. Uh, you know, Vegapunk's thinking to himself as he's looking at the sort of dried up lake full of books. He's saying, you know, good job protecting those books. You know, civilians of Ohara, 
this is this is a victory and uh vegapunk sees a like a crew of giants who are uh who have been tasked who have tasked themselves it seems with rounding these books up in in big nets and uh uh some familiar faces like haruden and uh gerd the 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 blonde the, the little blonde giant girl from big mom flashback this whole this whole and, episode uh, this whole episode has a sort of an an air of of calm around it it's it's uh-huh. it's interesting to see ohara how like just how bombed out and desolate it is after this but uh you know, it sort of uh, it leads into a sort of a good emotional place. I think this episode it's a it's an episode for taking your time and sort of just telling the story because this is a shocking revelation. Granted, we've all read it, well, most of us have read it in the manga prior to this, but just seeing uh, seeing the devastation, letting that sink in, and uh, you know the sort of uh, the scale of the government's crime here is you know it's uh, it's instructive. Yeah, and there's also that one giant with like the the orange hair bowl cut thing. I think his name is Goldberg. He, Goldberg, that's it. The goalie. That's for. And uh, over Vegapunk's shoulder, a voice appears. Not a familiar voice, because it's not a Monkey D. Dragon's usual voice actor, because I guess they wanted him to sound uh, younger. Yeah. Because the current guy they got... Uh, it's... um. Uh, he sounds like uh, he's going to go any day now. <laughs> really? That's, that's a shame. Present that's, day um, dragon. That's... Uh, oh, God. It's... um. Akio yeah, him and like Frankie's voice yeah. actor are like oh boy like, oh man you guys yeah. your your voices are just going to go soon yeah Frankie's voice actor I I had I had not noticed how I didn't realize Akio Otsuka I mean he's got to be pretty old at this point but that's too bad I really liked him wait Akio Otsuka where, oh wait no I'm thinking of Blackbeard never mind shit sorry Blackbeard is Akio Otsuka he's he's as lively as ever I think yeah I I, I honestly don't know who Vega Punk's voice actor is no I'm talking about Dragon's voice actor. Dragon's voice actor, right? Dra- Dragon's present day voice actor sounds very, very, very old. Right, right. And in the in this flashback, he's like, uh, he, he sounds like a younger man. I'm gonna have to look this up now. Uh, yeah. So this is Dragon, age thirty three, and we get the title card telling us that this is Vegapunk, forty three. Uh, the they discuss uh, the disinformation campaign going around against uh, Professor Clover. The government's been trying to paint him as somebody trying to destroy the world. Hmm. But they both know the truth. They they know his real character. Okay, so the original actor is, uh, he, or the current, the original actor is Hidekatsu Shibata, and he is 87 years old. Um, They're talking about uh, the, the giant, the, the, they refer to the bandaged person as the captain of the giants. I don't know how, if, how literal that is, but uh, there's a, there's a suspiciously familiar bandaged up giant who seems to be uh, kind of spearheading the whole re- rescue the books from the uh, from the lakes mission. He's a very distinctive who's, who's silhouette, elsewhere. even among giants. They place some flowers down at a makeshift makeshift grave for the people of Ohara. They just like took like a big chunk of tree bark from that that tree, and they stuck it in the ground. They wrote they etched Ohara into it and put flowers down there. Um, and they're talking about how you know dragons. He's he's gathering up his uh, his his new gang, his revolutionary army, and Vegapunk. Despite the two of them seeming to have a rapport, Vegapunk uh, won't be joining the revolutionaries because he needs he needs funding. He needs resources. He needs the stuff that only the government can give him. Yeah. Well, Dragon is uh, so offended by the government's crime here, just the destruction of people who are looking for knowledge or looking for truth, and uh, you know it's it's not. It's not a step too far for Vegapunk. He's so, I don't know, he's got that, the, like the the, uh, the the sort of the narcissism genius, believing uh-huh. that his uh, his discoveries are so important and so vital to the world, and also so important to him. He derives his sense of self from them. I think. Yeah, yeah. He he feels like whatever whatever good he can do to the world, he can do more of it uh, with with on the government's dollar. He couldn't live with himself if he didn't do it. You know, just on principle. If he wasn't, you know, if he was able to do it and didn't do it, I don't think he would, uh, he'd never forgive himself. And, uh, yeah, so Dra- Dragon's making his big, uh, you know, the triumphant music's playing. Dragon's kind of going into a speech about, uh, you know, how they'll, they'll, they have to stop the government. Uh, they can't allow this kind of injustice to, to continue. Um, and, uh, the, the little narration and the stage lights are, 
filling us in that this is this is shortly before Dragon would join forces with uh, Bartholomew Kuma and Emporio Ivankov. And uh, we come back to the present and the Straw Hats are all, they're all different kinds of impressed, right? Usopp's like, oh, did you say Elbaf? Did you mention Giants of Elbaf? And Nami seems to be impressed by uh, Dragon's passion as a, as a revolutionary, as a, as just a passionate person. And Robin, uh, she, she's putting two and two together. She's putting one plus one together. Um, and uh, she's asking Shaka, like, hey, uh, that person you were talking about, that was Jaguar D. Saul, wasn't it? And uh, Shaka, he like he doesn't like outright confirm it. He's just like, we have to keep his uh, his his location a, a secret for now. But, you know, you, you get it. You get it. And Robin's like crying her happy tears. So uh, the, you know, basically Vegapunk. Went uh, at some point after this visit to O'Hara, Vegapunk did visit Elbaf and visited their libraries to read all the, because they're not going to keep the the O'Hara books anywhere that the government can reach them. So they're staying safe on Elbaf and Vegapunk b- visited, read all the books, all the information stored in his head. Uh, you see the you see the silhouette of of Saul in that library, like basically pointing Vegapunk. You know, yeah, they all but show his books. face. They like they basically show his whole face. Except for like part of it's in shadow, but like you know who it is. It's yeah, you can Saul. tell by the does he have his hat? His like cowboy hat and his like big kind of scruffy, big beard. mullet thing. Yeah. Um, and then the straw hats, uh, magnet boots, start dragging them across the floor and into a different room. Uh, and that brings us to the eye catch. Back at the scrapyard, uh, Luffy is flying around with his new rocket shoes. He's like, "Oh, look at me, guys! I'm just like Sanji." And uh, this, yeah, this is where Bonnie's asking Vegapunk about his head. Like, hey, what's up, old man? Last time I saw you, your your head was big and like a light bulb. And yeah, this is where Vegapunk's <laughs> making some crack. It's like, oh, the last time you would have saw me, I was probably as tall as a giant. But he, he mentions that the re- so so the question is, what happened to your head? And then Vegapunk says, hmm, it was getting long, so I cut it. And then. Uh, <laughs> Bonnie's like, don't just say that. Like, you just got a haircut. I mean, basically, he did. Don't, I do. It, don't like, say it like a like a like so casually. They have uh, the um, like the the flashing part, like where his real head was supposed to be. That goes on for a little while. It's just yeah, like as uh, Vegapunk is is expositing, we get the this kind of after image of where wh- what his head would look like if he still had it. There's a lot of expositing, and, uh, a lot of Vegapunk expositing in this uh, in this episode. And although they do they do add some levity, there is a little bit of uh, of, of lightness here after all that uh, after all that sad stuff in the first half. So Vegapunk explains that uh, the reason his head is so big is because he ate the the brain brain, <laughs> and then he like bites his tongue. Yeah, he's so he's always keeping that thing out. Yeah. Uh it's it's I guess brain brain fruit is hard to say in, in Japanese and and. His tongue is just so ready to be bitten. You get the explanation uh, yeah, on the so uh, punk records too. Yeah, he cut his head off, and it basically his brain is is in like punk records, the big giant's like central egg, of which like if you you know look at it from below the island, you can read kind of the the ceiling under the crack of it, where it says punk records, and uh, the the apple part is like an antenna. That's that's allowing him to like always be communicating with his uh, giant remote brain, yeah. and uh, his uh, you know his his clones, his satellites, are all different facets of him, and they all once a day they all like kind of sync up their their data, their their information, so they all have access to the same uh, brain basically. This is kind of done in like uh, clip art vision, like his excited description of it is all done in clip art. Yeah. It's just another way of saving on animation this episode. This is a pretty static episode. Uh, so Vegapunk's dream, basically, is he wants to uh, share punk records with the world. Like, everything he reads, he remembers, and it gets stored in this in this central location. And uh, he's devising uh, a strategy to, you know, allow everybody to basically have an antenna to it. 
is sort of the idea. It's, it's, he's he's describing a very uh, one PC version of the internet. And uh, Jim Bay is like, hmm, I know about the internet. I know, I know. Sometimes people get ideas up in there. Um. So so Jim Bay just very cynically is is like, well, what if ideology gets in the mix of this like big central brain hub, and Vegapunk just kind of like brushes it off, like, ha. Huh, uh, if we worry about that, then uh, we can never advance science. But you've probably got a point, but whatever. And then that, that kind of sets Bonnie off. Because uh, she's like, hey, you, you, your selfish pursuit of science has enabled all these terrible things to happen, including my, my father being turned into a cyborg. And she's like get try- readying to get her revenge on Vegapunk by gravi- grabbing like a lightsaber thing, a, a laser sword beam thing to threaten him and uh vegapunk tries to warn her like hey you know that beam is defective it's not actually like a a, a laser laser it um and then before he can finish uh, uh it's too late because the the swarms of insects are already coming uh because that's what the the beam actually does it just attracts bugs and uh bonnie is comically afraid of bugs and conveniently and so unconscious for the rest out. of the next couple episodes she passes out. She's conveniently unconscious for the next couple episodes. Luffy doesn't seem to like recognize that she's not waking up anytime soon because he's like, "Hey, Bonnie, check out this great stag beetle I found." And he spends like the whole episode just kind of like holding on to this very like friendly looking stag beetle. And when they see him on the monitor the in the next episode, he's still holding it. Yeah. Um, and then Vegapunk's like, "Oh yeah, this is an appropriate time to ask. I heard you guys were in Wano recently." D- did you guys hear about this second dragon that isn't Kaido? Um, and then uh, Luffy's like, oh, yeah, we know that guy. Mamanosuke, he's he's great. And uh, Vegapunk's like, oh, well, I developed that synthetic devil fruit. That that would have been the thing that uh, Mamanosuke accidentally ate on Punk Hazard. It does explain why um, it doesn't have all the negative side effects of Caesar's devil fruits. Yeah, it's not it's not a smile fruit. It's a... Uh, it's probably a more advanced, but it's a complete failure at, as synthetic it, fruit. It's a complete failure because the dragon was the wrong color. Uh, this right, is probably the funniest moment of these episodes. I I thought this was really yeah, funny. like uh, like Doctor Brief, uh, the, the, the stereo the, the speakers. The, yeah, the stereo speakers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's where I thought of. <laughs> it's like no, it, yep, it's not finished yet. We can't let you into space. It's like oh man, what what uh, what kind of terrible technological uh <laughs> hurdle must we cross he's like i just can't get the position of these speakers right just can't get the color of the animal right yeah he, well he breathes uh, fire and that's good enough for luffy and vegapunk cries over this failure and uh jim base is like oh that's a perfectionist for you giant slamming his face into the trash pile as as a way of apologizing <laughs> to, to himself really right yeah and then the conversation turns to the big uh, Iron Giant, which I guess is what we're going to be calling it uh, colloquially. I would, co- co- that's a hard word for me. I've been calling him. Uh, I've been calling him Robonosuke. I think Luffy calls him that in the next episode. Yeah, L- Luffy calls him Robonosuke. I hope that catches uh, on. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and then they 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 most commonly refer to it as as the Iron Giant, mm-hmm. Superman. And uh, so we we learned a few episodes ago that the Iron Giant was made during the Void Century, but it it in particular also has a history of having attacked Mary Joa sometime two hundred years ago, when the Ryugu Kingdom um, joined the uh, the world government. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, wait, that's in the next episode. No, uh, sorry. Yeah, so the the we finished the episode off with uh, some with a with a government ship arriving, and it's CP zero, they're all here. They're all wearing their their eyes wide shut masks. <laughs> uh, they're like, we are here. We you know we're under orders to kill Vegapunk to be continued. And then for the like little like post credits, uh, you know, hey children, gather around. Here's a here's a history lesson for you. Mm-hmm. Bit. It's not uh, Robin and Chopper anymore. It's now Lilith and Edison because Lilith hijacked it the episode before. Oh, that's right. I hadn't thought about that in a while. Yeah, I usually I don't I don't really pay too close attention to them, but I did write down that uh, uh, this week they talked about Monkey D Dragon. I mean, I can see why these are necessary, and I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind that they're there. 
Oh, no, no. Yeah. I like him. Mm-hmm. Episode 1098, The Eccentric Dream of a Genius. And this is where this is where Luffy starts talking about Robonosuke. Uh, apparently, the government had ordered uh, Robonosuke's destruction to happen. But, the, you know, scientific curiosity is too strong, so Vegapunk has been harboring it privately. He's like, yes, obviously the government can't know that, like, I still have it. Like, it's supposed to be, you know, we're supposed to put it in the, in the smelting pot. I wonder how destructible um, it is, even when you know when it's not powered. If it, is it just iron you could melt down? I'm I'm curious. No, there's a lot of questions. Can you terminate her to it? <laughs> right. You know, Shaka expl- uh, You know, elsewhere, Shaka is explaining to the other part of the crew, uh, basically all the same information, and even mentions that uh, the Vega Force One that Lilith was piloting earlier, the 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 Gigantor looking robot, mm-hmm. uh, was modeled after this same Iron Giant. Uh, but they can't seem to replicate its technology, and and we're still not entirely clear what's so special about this technology that uh, that is so exclusive to this this thing or this this uh, previous kingdom. I gotta want to say one other thing I've I've been enjoying in this episode. I think in particular in this one, where Vegapunk gets his own super friends love American style heart shaped transition. It's yeah, uh, there's a lot of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's it's a little thing, but. Uh... Yeah, I find it amusing. Uh, Luffy tells Vegapunk, it's like, oh yeah, Lu- Bonnie was mad at you, so you should be on your knees and groveling for forgiveness. And Vegapunk's like, you don't even know like what our history is. You don't even know why you're saying this. Uh, and uh, then Vegapunk's like, oh yeah, uh, a lot of, uh, oh yeah, and here's, an, here's, here's the time to bring this up. Please take me off of Egghead. I need a, I need a ride. Yeah, the um, government's and, uh, uh, government's getting wise. Yes, and appropriately, we cut to CP Zero facing off with uh, all the like the sea beast cyborgs that hang out at the at the around the oceans of of Egghead, and um, uh, they shoot one of the beasts down while uh, you know calling into Egghead and asking for permission. Like, hey, we're CP Zero. We're asking for you to let us in. That that shouldn't be a problem, right, Vegapunk? <laughs> it's a problem. Yeah, w- one of the agents is like, "Oh yeah, by the way, uh, uh, C- Captain Lucci, or, or you know, whatever his rank is, Director Lucci. I guess is Spandam still director, or is he a different role? I think Spandam's part of CP Zero. I don't like. Yeah, he was in uh, Film Gold, but he's right. But um, he's it's not. It's just sort of. I assume they take orders from the five elders. If there's if there's yeah. even like a commanding officer or anything, I I, I don't know. Uh, they're like, oh, but uh, we saw the Julie Bonnie in the area, um, and then Lucci's like, okay, well, we don't need her anymore, so if we see her, we're we're killing her too. So that's interesting. What do, what did they previously need her for, huh? Yeah. Um, and Lila thinks it's cool that CP Zero's here. She's like, hey, we're part of the government. We don't, we're, we're, we're evil, right? Like that's, that's my feeling. That's my feeling. I get to project onto other people. Um, we, Lilith, we it's all you talk. It's all you talk about. Lilith. It's, it's kind of tiresome. We, we're, you're evil. We get it. But she's a fun kind of evil. Yeah. She doesn't really, she doesn't really mean it. It's true. It, it comes in, it comes in handy. Uh, we cut to Kamabaka queendom where, uh, the revolutionaries are like, they have, uh, Kuma like plugged up into this, uh, I guess like outside hyperbolic time chamber or, or like healing chamber thing. Uh, and, and Kuma is like, you know, waking up. He's like, Oh my, my daughter's in trouble. I have to, you know, but he's, he's not like fully conscious yet. He doesn't really, he's just kind of like move his body's moving on its own, tearing himself out of the plugs and like trying to run to the shore and kind of stumbling and getting up while the revolutionaries are trying to stop him. Uh, but they can't because, uh, Kuma's got the, the papa powers. He can just, poof himself away and uh now he's flying through the sky on his way to egghead it seems or wherever he was going sorry i wanted to go back to one thing first uh the idea of like the free energy the, the, like what what powers the iron giant for like, the, the energy uh-huh. from the 
200 years ago or from the 900 years ago whenever it was created that's like one of the great conspiracy like real life conspiracy like technologies of like people who claim to have invented free energy like it just broadcasts out into the air and it powers everything mm-hmm. for free like people who you know quacks who are working on this who are being silenced by the by the by the government and the and the establishment you know it's you know nothing's ever been shown that it could possibly work but it's one of the great uh great uh, quack technologies that people are, are in search of on uh, you know if you ever used to listen to coast to coast am uh you probably heard people talk about it a lot well good thing nobody's ever heard about the sun <laughs> right um, if only we, if only we could uh yeah if only we could somehow convert that with panels of some kind into hmm that'll never work yeah and this is this you know this is this, this is the scene now where vegapunk is kind of rambling on about his utopia, this uh, infinite energy that he's looking to harness, uh, you know, and, and Jinbei just like has to be very cynical about basically every one of uh, Vegapunk's daydreams. Like, Hey, if uh, somebody did have a, a way of producing energy, the way you say, uh, you know, that, that, that's this the thing people go to war over, you know, like that's not, uh, it's never that simple. And Vegapunk is just like, well, I mean, think about it. There's, there is technically energy everywhere. There's, there's available opportunities to make energy as long as, uh, you know, how to harness them efficiently. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Luffy's, uh, response to all this is basically like, you know, I, I dig the altruism. Like I, I understand and think it's cool that you want to help the world and stuff. But like I gotta, I gotta put my foot down. I don't want to look like a hero. Uh, I got, I gotta look out for me and uh, my boys and girls and whoever feeds me, <laughs> and whoever, whoever you know, just kind of makes me laugh a little bit. I'll, the, the, I'll protect those people. But you know, yeah. I just love the, I love the way they do that though, because Vegapunk is again often his dream world of. Car- like it's extremely cartoony and very whimsical looking and he finishes and he's in like the captain morgan pose you know from the liquor not from the, the pirate uh with the, for the, the big foot up eh, science will get us there someday and he's twinkling and sparkling and luffy's picking his nose and it's a it's a perfect transition to sort of illustrate what <laughs> kinds of people uh different kinds of people these these guys are yeah because like vegapunk and it's all luffy, neon and they're not neon like, crazy and different in, in yeah. their like you know, you, you know, they have their their kind of selfish vices that they have to be true to, mm-hmm. uh, and and that's part. You know, that's that's at once like you know one of their weaknesses, but also like one of the reasons why they are capable of as much as they are. Uh, and a big explosion interrupts their conversation, and then Vegapunk's like, "Oh yeah, that thing I was mentioning earlier where I wanted you to take me away. This is why, um, because uh, CP Zero is attacking the city." Dun, 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 to be continued yeah and then the the post credits lilith and edison conversation this time is about emporio ivankov because he got he got brought up earlier in the episode and then 1099 preparations for interception rob lucci strikes and uh, so CP Zero, they're requesting S Bear to use his. Uh, I guess S Bear has the simulate has has the simulated Papa powers. Um, so you can send uh, all the CP Zero agents flying onto the island, which I which w- I guess is a flashback to explain how we got to the explosion. Or no, the explosion was the explosion like, is you know, the ship, the sea beasts. Yeah, the yeah, ship. Right, the, right. Ship, the ship is being blown up. So so they, know, they let their ship explode, but they they you know. To basically teleported themselves safely onto the island. These these sea beasts are slow on the uptake. They see this whole thing happen, and everyone's gone. Like, well, I guess it's too late. Just destroy the ship, I suppose. Yeah, Vegapunk knows it's CP Zero coming after him, and Luffy is confused because he re- he you know surprisingly remembers CP Nine, but he's like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. If, I think you got your numbers wrong, old man. When when somebody said CP previously to me, it was with a nine, not a zero. So. <laughs> You know, reevaluate your notes, I suppose. Uh, the citizens of uh, Egghead uh, are confused because they're like, oh, this is Cypherpole, but aren't Cypherpole known for wearing black suits? Like, what's the super special white suits about? The only uh, the only person black- who's really excited right now is Kaku. Everyone else is either scared or just, you know, Stussy and Lucci are just 
they got they got nothing going on in the face area. But Kaku is just. I mean, they're all the, wearing masks. Well, they're so with the masks. They, on, they, they but can't like, really express much. Kaku's outside of uh, Kaku's excitement is palpable. He's freaking out. He's yeah. He's becoming more like Usopp. <sighs> Uh, so back at the lab, Shaka's like telling Pythagoras, like, hey, warn the island. This is this is an emergency situation. Uh, bring out the Seraphim and let Sentomaru lead them. So we can expect uh, Sentomaru to show up and be on Vegapunk's side, it seems. Yeah, all the... Uh, Vegapunk is... We, yeah, Vegapunk... Or Sentomaru known for being Vegapunk's bodyguard. Right. And the Seraphim all get Power Ranger introductions or Sentai introductions here. Yeah. Yeah, S-Hawk, S-Snake, and S-Shark. And just very... Uh, very blatantly, like, S-Snake is just the one white one of them. Hold on. I'm, I, I've got it playing in the background. I didn't think, I didn't really notice like, that. Yeah, like, the group shot. Like, it's it's like egregious, actually. I wasn't, uh, wasn't looking for that, I guess. I mean, like, it's it's weird because, like, aren't the, like, aren't the Seraphim, like, already kind of like a weird brown face situation? Yeah, it's, well, I, I think that's supposed to be from, like, the Lunarian blood, possibly. But like, still, like having like previous non dark skin characters, like oh, here is the dark skin version right. of them. But then having one of them not be is just that's just makes right. It, yeah, just, that, that's not that doesn't work. Which, and which, you're right, you way, and you are which right, way I'm Western man? <laughs> yeah. Oh god. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh huh. The, the, the Seraphim are just children. It's not their fault, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's not their fault. It might it's be Vegapunk's you know, fault. Whoever colored the episode. Well, that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I I would kind of, I would hope it w- it wouldn't be a down to one person, but that just means that it, there was you know someone told them to do it that way. Whoever whoever was in charge of that fill bucket tool, right? Uh, Vegapunk tells the crew to take a Bonnie above the clouds and take the vacuum rocket. And uh, Luffy and Chopper think this is a great sounding idea, <laughs> and he so, just like, absolutely uh, Nimoy's out of there. Star Trek's out of there. Just Star Trek's out of there. Uh, back in the city, Kaku uh, takes notice of the the big CGI hologram dragon that Atlas was fighting earlier, and uh, Kaku's like, "Let's not underestimate this this magnificent beast." Like he's he's super immediately respecting the power of this this fake dragon. Um, and the the you know grunt agents start shooting at the dragon. But to no avail, because obviously it's just a hologram and, and they pass right through. But Kaku, you know, he's he's not catching on yet. He's like, hmm, the dragon is just that strong. It can't even be, you know, the, the, the bullets do nothing to it because it must be a space monster. And so he goes in to fight, starts throwing some Tempest kicks, which also phase right through the hologram. And uh, Stussy, down on the floor, down on the ground, Knew it was a hologram. She's like, oh, yeah, the thing's fake. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the dorkening. Like, well, why would you Kaku. let me embarrass myself first? <laughs> why not? Uh, Sushi thinks that this place is nostalgic, she says. So she's been here. She's She's got history with Egghead and the technology. And she's able to uh, explain what uh, the island is doing a little bit too late for, for Kaku to you know make a fool of himself. Um. Yeah, because Kaku's going. It's like, oh, there's uh, there's Punk Records. I'll I'll just moonwalk up there, and then right as he's about to approach, Stussy's like, oh, hey, Lucci, you know those like two rings, like Saturn-like rings, around Punk Records. Oh yeah, that's a defense system, and Kaku's about to get himself blown out. Um, and then Kaku gets himself blown out, and he falls, and he's yelling at Stussy. Kaku gets to Kaku livens up this uh, this episode. The CP Zero gang is usually pretty dour. Not uh, not the lightest of people. Yeah, is this stuff in the manga? Like, is this like whole like like comedy routine of of Kaku? Well, I mean, like Kaku has and... definitely gotten funnier, or he's playing he's always the, like he's playing that role more since the beginning of Egghead. We definitely commented on it at the time. I don't remember how exactly it went down, but Kaku is definitely he gets to be he gets to be the the funny man of the group, basically. Uh, the I, I I've noticed like a lot of the civilians uh, look like they're pulled. Right out of like, uh, we love Katamari. <laughs> well, especially with the ones with the heads. Yeah, I know what you mean. They, they kind of look like their faces are screens. And uh, Atlas comes storming in. Uh, you know, like who's acting more violently than me on Egghead? 
I can't have that. I can't have destruction that isn't my own. And so she's, you know, angry. She's ready for a fight. Stussy's like, that's a Vegapunk. And uh, Lucci recognizes that, uh, okay, well, she's a Vegapunk. She's my prey. And that brings us to the eye catch of the, ep- of the episode. So canonically, she's uh, spinning her arm there for about two minutes. Yeah. In the lab, Sanji's watching the screen like, hey, someone's got to stop that that cutie. I, th- I think he's talking about Stussy. I think he just uh-huh. means Atlas is kind of like, you know, cute, cute. Not like, cute like a fuzzy thing is cute. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Lucci, he's like, a get, I mean, he has to get serious. He has to remove his mask. He's oh, you meant Sanji. Persona. Sorry. You meant Sanji. Yes, you're right. Sanji. Yeah, yeah Sanji. Yeah. Sanji. Yeah. Uh, Lu- Lucci removes his mask and he prays to flex his cape off. Or his coat. His cape light coat. His, his cape like coat. Crumb crisp coating. And he goes leopard mode. And just immediately, straight into Six King Pistol, blows half of Atlas's face off. Atlas's hair spikes into like a sea urchin shape. Instant defeat. Um, uh, is is one of these uh, civilians voiced by Ikue Otani, like Chopper's actress? She sounds like so similar. You know, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised, but uh, I feel like I hear that sometimes, and I don't. I never bother to check, but it could just be that like. There's just people It'd be hard who sound to check like, like a yeah. like an extra voice like that. I think yeah, unless you're reading the Japanese uh, Japanese credits that might be in there. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, Luffy and Co are running, and while they are running with with like Bonnie and Arm, they're like, wait a second, we didn't even ask where this vacuum rocket is supposed to be. <laughs> he didn't tell us. We don't know what it, lo- what it looks like. We don't know what it is. So that 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 plan's kind of shot. We're only just now thinking to ask. And the the running just brings them right into the scene, right right into Lucci versus Atlas. And, Very uh, long lived dust cloud. Or I guess Atlas's face is constantly it's still on fire, so there is a lot of smoke. But through the smoke, Luffy sees uh, he sees Lucci. Yeah, and he's like, oh, wh- 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 "What are you doing here, pigeon guy?" <laughs> and then Lucci just like gives gives a nice dramatic pause. It's a government island. We can be here. And then Luffy just kind of plays right into it. Like, oh, you're right. We're the intruders. That's right. I forget sometimes. <laughs> um, and uh, Kaku and Stussy are both like, yo, bro, let's not fight an emperor right now. You need to get permission for that. We need permission for that. We don't, you know, we might uh, anger some allies we don't know about, you know. So like let's let's stay on on task. Let's let's keep with our agenda here. Um, but Lucci's like, I know I'm not supposed to fight, and he like has an ellipse. He's like, you know the the, the rest wanna. of that sentence is, but I wanna, <laughs> but I'm gonna. Um, but uh, Luffy ta- Luffy takes that decision out of his hands. Yeah, Luffy sees Atlas. He notices finally after like standing there for a minute. He sees Atlas destroyed. And Chopper goes to rush to help her, but uh, he, Chopper's not a robot doctor. He's like, this is more, this is more Frankie's territory. <laughs> and uh, Luffy seems kind of harrowed by this, like, oh, Frankie's not here. Like, we we can't, uh, we might not be able to help her in time. Yeah, so he uh, heaves Bonnie Luffy, into Jinbei's arms. Yeah, and he and he's getting mad. He's like, that girl, that big robot girl, gave us food, and that's all I need to to start this fight. He's a bit of a flashback about the food, too. On that cliffhanger, to be continued. And the little post-credits this time is Lilith and Edison talking about Kaku and his history in the story. Mm -hmm. We we do get to see some great clips of uh, Kaku as a giraffe. So him turning himself into a cube, always a good time. Yep. In case uh, you weren't prepped for that to happen in the story. General thoughts on these three episodes, Ed? Uh, slow pace, slow pace. But uh, on the other hand, like I didn't feel, I, like I said earlier, I didn't feel like it dragged. I think the first episode got some good emotional moments. Uh, I mean, Robin, the thing with Saul really hit, I think, harder in the manga than it did here. But uh, you know, it's a lot of expository. It's a lot of setting up what the stakes are for Vegapunk and sort of the Straw Hats in particular. And, uh, you know, 
setting up things for the future with the Iron Giant. But it, ultimately, it does require a, a lot of talking. And I think the end of the third episode really goes a long way towards, you know, things are going to start happening on Egghead now. So we feel that quickening of action. We feel that uh, that conflict coming in. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm excited. To, I, I've been happy to have Rob Lucci and Kaku and CP0 back in this arc, especially these characters. And Susie and Kaku and Lucci are, are very are a welcome addition here. And, uh, yeah, it will uh, see where it goes. But uh, these were these were these episodes were a breeze. Yeah, these episodes were capital F fine. Um, uh, it it would have been nice if uh, the next episode was in this in this recap batch because that that would have been like a cool payoff. Uh, the next episode preview looks amazing. Yes, so it's gonna be a, there's gonna be. I think the Sakuga community is needs to be prepared. Well, I mean, I don't want to get hype it up too much, but it looked great. It really did. It looks cool, and uh, like I, I think, I think just like a, a central shortcoming of Egghead, even in the manga, is that there's a li- there's like there's like a bizarre amount of standing around and talking and, and exposition, um, like that, like like more so than One Piece normally has, and and that's where I think that the anime episodes are gonna suffer the most because it's like okay, yeah, we just watched three episodes and it felt like one thing happened. Um, I mean, I was thinking about this earlier when I was watching them because I rewatched the first two episodes as well because I had the time. Uh, but it feels like they are allowed to have one thing happen per episode. Yeah, generally that's that's been the case. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess that's going back to like in Wano as well. But uh, you know, it's it just sort of like leads me to thinking about like I, I was dwelling a lot on like how how inelegant a lot of the exposition is. Like a lot of it's like oh. Uh, I might as well bring this up now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because <laughs> cause when else is it going to uh, organically happen? Right. But then um, also things could, you know, Oda yeah, has the conversations it. don't, don't feel like they're, they're natural uh, progressions of each other. But then Oda, Oda also um, has the habit of like, you know, a character will put off until the end of the arc to really reveal something as well. So even if they hint at it, I mean, like if it's, if it's dramatically interesting, I don't mind that so much. It's just like, yeah. You know, like the the actual like moment to moment needs uh needs some variety, needs some uh, you know turn turning us on our heads. Yeah, I will say I I should probably look up who uh, Vegapunk's voice actor is, but I think he's he's done a very good job with his like he had to do that thing with like um you know the biting his tongue thing and uh, the, the mm-hmm. way and the way he gets excited uh, talking about like his utopia and when he's on these flights of fancy and the animation gets funky with him and I think he does that. Uh, it does that it does that really well yeah it's a uh, it's it, it was the japanese voice of rick sanchez is the <laughs> of course yes we have mentioned that before that's right and doofenshmirtz on uh phineas and ferb shuhei sakaguchi i don't know what else he's really known for but uh he's, he's been a good vegapunk i think mm-hmm. yep yeah. anything else you'd like to, to say before we go ahead and wrap up the episode Wait a second. It's Yohei Tarano. Shuhei Sakaguchi is the voice of Shaka. That, that that's. Uh... Oh okay. Yeah. Who's? Uh, do, can you look up who who else Shaka's voice actor do, does? Um. Let's see here. Uh, he's known for doing. Uh... Oh man. Uh. Let's see. <laughs> what what else? Oh, he was Kawachi in Yakitate Japan. That's the thing that I. That's that's what I've known him for, which is interesting because that's the sort of a uh, high energy. Uh, you know, Osaka Ben character. But um he hasn't done a lot that I have seen, honestly. He was Jugo in Naruto. Right, well. Yeah. But yeah, not, not not much else. I know I know I know the bread baking anime. People should watch watch Yakitate Japan. It's a good show. Uh all yeah, right. that that's all I got. <laughs> Alright. Thank you, Ed. Should we uh shall we round off the show? We shall. All right. <laughs> has been the one piece podcast episode 811 for the week of tuesday april 2nd 2024 and on this episode we had our triple anime recap for episodes 1097 1098 and 1099 we will be back next week 
for a uh, SBS volume recap of, was that volume 108, I think I said? Yes, volume 108. And uh, yeah, uh, I think that'll be uh, Stephen and uh, I think we call them Team Dark. So uh, I think that's Josh and Bureau and, Bureau and Brodsky. Brodsky. There we go. Yep. Didn't want to miss anybody. But uh, so, yeah, check that out. And Sam, where can the good people out there find you? They can find me on Twitter at Lucky Chainsaw, and they can find me on Blue Sky at lcsam.bsky.social. Cool. I am also on Twitter still. You can contact me there. I'm Edward E. One Piece. I'm just Edward E. on Blue Sky. The podcast can be found at the new and improved One Piece Podcast.com. Uh, One Piece Podcast at gmail.com is our, email, is our email address. Please support us, patreon.com slash One Piece Podcast. If you haven't listened to it before, go listen to uh, the Force to Watch 4 Kids series and learn all about the 4 Kids version of One Piece. And um, let's see, you can subscribe on... Actually, you can go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash One Piece Podcast. There's some interesting stuff on there. Uh, you can subscribe on SoundCloud, subscribe on Spotify, iHeartRadio, subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, or call us on our phone number. That's 347-497-MAJI. 347-497-6254. Call any time for your questions, your comments, your theories. And we are actually trying to put together something to actually get people's voice comments on the show again. Zach is working on it. So hopefully uh, we'll have something to show for that soon. But uh, that's it for the One Piece podcast. My name is Ed. And my name is Sam. Thanks, everybody, for stopping by for an anime recap this week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.